world building is something that a lot of fantasy authors or D&D or other TTRPG game masters need to go through to create an epic and amazing story. And I think it is insanely fascinating topic and the subject of creating gods and building worlds is very, very interesting. However, it can prove to be very time consuming as well as even sometimes boring. Welcome to Dungeon Hussars, where today we'll be discussing the subject of world building, especially for D&D, but most of the advice that I'll be providing will be very universal. So if you're searching for world building advice for your fantasy novels, then this video can also be for you. The thing that inspired this whole video was Brandon Sanderson's lecture about world building for fantasy and sci-fi writing. And if you're interested in purely his approach to world building, I'll link those videos in the description. At the beginning of this video, let's establish why do we even world build. The first reason why many of fantasy authors or D&D game masters turn to world building is that fantasy is a genre where setting is an important aspect, more important than in any other genre. Thus, fantasy gives us much more freedom in what and how are we creating. Second reason is that world building is just really cool. It makes the creators of a world feel like gods with omnipotent power over their own creation. Some of us will make our worlds very realistic, hoping that somewhere in the infinite universe our world exists, and while we are looking at the stars, we will know that our characters look back at us, while others will create insane chaos like the early works of H.P. Lovecraft and his dream world. Another reason why people world build is that world building just gives us the sense of wonder and allows us to explore our creations, learn about new things and feel the satisfaction when we learn that a similar event to what we had created happened in the real world history. Wait, or am I the only one that experienced this? I honestly don't know, let me know in the comments. Speaking of the comments, I don't want to be that annoying YouTuber, but only about 5% of you subscribe to this channel, so I would be very grateful if you'd like to subscribe and smash the like button, it's literally free. But back to the video. Apart from those wonderful reasons why you should start world building, there are also some problems with it especially one, which I think may be disencouraging for new members of the community. So what I think is the biggest mistake that almost everyone makes while creating a new world is something called the world builder's disease, which in fantasy writing means focusing so much on the world and the details in this world to make it perfect and realistic, but never actually starting to write a story for that world that you've created. And this isn't exclusive to just writing a book, because when I went on various world building forums, I realized how many people out there just want to create their own Middle Earth or Dune with all the tiny details, creating thousands of years of the world's history, mapping all the different continents, and making even whole time lapses of how cultures appeared and then disappeared from their worlds, but they have never actually started writing, because there was always something that was unknown in their world something that needed to be fixed or changed. Just like Kelsier says, there's always another secret. I had that problem in the past and now I'm still struggling not to get overwhelmed by the world builder's disease. For example, when I was starting to GM my first campaign, I saw a video on my YouTube homepage. It was something like creating a conlang tutorial from Biblaridon. That was the moment when my world builder's disease started. In a span of few weeks I started watching him, Artificial and Hello Future Me. And about 6 months later I was sitting with a calculator trying to figure out how the presence of 7 different planets with different masses in my solar system will influence the orbits, while simultaneously researching the ancient religions of the Middle East. Now that turned out to be completely irrelevant information for the campaign's story, but I thought I needed to know that for the campaign. It's worth noting here that I don't say this as a form of critique of those channels that I've watched. No, I still admire them for creating awesome world building tutorials and worlds. Though if you want to create your fantasy world for a D&D campaign, you probably won't have enough time for such details. Unless, that is, you are a forever player and you still want to be a GM, but your time still hasn't come. However, 
Even if you are still waiting for your D&D group to play in your wonderful world that you've spent 20 years crafting, remember to avoid just writing literal encyclopedia entries to be read by your players. Because when you are a D&D player, you probably just want to play whatever your playstyle is. Whether you are a huge combat enjoyer who optimizes every single build to a maximum level, or a role player that wants to experience a story through the character's eyes. Your players might be skeptical about playing a campaign in which they have to read hundreds of pages of lore to even start playing the game. Honestly, you might have just created a new Middle Earth, but the players will never be able to play in it, because the learning curve for your fantasy world is so steep that everyone who becomes interested in your setting would be immediately overwhelmed by the amount of information that they need to consume and process. I would like to just give you a quick tip on how to flatten your settings learning curve before jumping into how I like to world build. So you should present your players a short document containing the style of your campaign to tease the world to them. And when I mean short, I don't mean 50 pages like some of you are getting ready to write, but a maximum of 5 pages so your players will actually read it and not just return to what they normally do. After that, when you actually start playing, show them only the amount of world building information that is story relevant. Doing this will be great while establishing promises and payoffs. The players will feel rewarded when they spot a world building detail that would become relevant to the main story thus making them more keen to your world. So, how do I like to world build? Well, the first thing that is crucial to note while you're world building for your TTRPG campaign is to have the world just as a background of the story that you are trying to tell. Do not push your world building as the most important part of your campaign. Despite that I have said that setting in fantasy is the most important as setting can get in all of these genres, it still is one of the least valuable and interesting elements of your story. The players just find the plot and characters, especially their characters, more interesting than the setting. Brando Sando even said that when you have a bad setting, but you have a great plot and great characters, you still can have a good story, which is impossible when you have a great setting, but bad plot and characters. So... now what? We know that world building too much may be impossible, and even if it is possible, there is still a risk that your players will not be interested in the setting at all. How do we fix that? If you remember what I previously said, then you probably know that we reveal only enough world building that is story relevant, at least at the beginning. When we, for example, introduce a horde in far northern peripheries of your world, if the players won't encounter the horde, They'll just completely ignore it and most likely forget about it. However, if you start it with the players having to do some quests like the standard escort a caravan from town to town, and you suddenly describe that they see a big group of people charging on the caravan, the players will suddenly feel way more interested in finding who that was. Now, when you tell them about the Horde, they will become more interested and as the campaign progresses and they will have more encounters with the Horde, more of the world will be revealed and your players are going to naturally search for answers to what is happening in the campaign by learning about your world. Alright, so far I've only talked about small tips on how to improve your world building, though we still don't have a world to work with. Let's start by creating something unique to your world, something that will make your world special. It could be literally anything, from creating a world in a binary star system and making the climate extremely unstable, to saying that a crop is blessed by a god of your world which implies only the chosen can eat it. What I recommend you doing with your special thing is to link it to the main theme and story of your campaign. Let's say that you have this special crop which for centuries have been planted and harvested by the priests in the valley of a river. However, recently the church's idea to expand their territory caused the population of their land to be dissatisfied with the church's action. To make matters worse, the expansionist policy had violated the balance of power, and now different foreign powers are competing over who will take the valley for themselves. I think this setting would make a nice background for a political intrigue campaign, though this wouldn't be great one for a typical saving the world campaign. Though you could take only the unique crop concept and put it in a setting that would refit that save the world campaign. But what to do if you don't have any ideas about what special traits your world can have? Do not worry, dear viewer, because you can just use a random table for that occasion. 
I will show you how to do that. Let's start the wheel of world building ideas. So, we'll have a mystery campaign, fauna or flora as our physical detail, and economy as our cultural one. Let's go! Okay, so the first thing that we'll need to do is to actually think about how we can tie our world building ideas together. How plants or animals influence the economy, and how those two things combined can together create a nice setting for a mystery story. Answering the first question, believe me or not, fauna and flora impacts our real world economy. I know, I know, that's a shocking information. The plants and animals that we make our food, furniture or clothes of have an impact on the economy. Who would have guessed? So, our job would be to create plants and or animals that will have an impact on the economy. A good example in the real world were the opium wars. Now, how about combining those with our fantasy setting? After all, opium wars were caused by a plant that was impacting the economy. We can create one isolationist power whose population is largely addicted to some herbs which grow in the swamps that are controlled by some trade confederation established to end the conflicts between all the colonies that started creating their own plantations there. As you can see, now we have a pretty decent plant that impacts the economy. Now let's think about how we can introduce more conflict and impactful fauna and flora for this setting. Maybe the swamps are full of deadly monsters. Maybe the native population of the swamps has unique abilities that allow them to control the monsters and now they want to kick the colonists out of their homeland. Or maybe it is something almost opposite, the swamp has never actually had any native population. Because everywhere there are some plants that as their form of defense release a cloud of poisonous gas. You can even do both at the same time, with the natives and the monsters adapting to the environment around them. Being able to immediately recognize plants that emit clouds of gas and avoid them. Managing this would probably take a lot of time and resources for the trade confederation. So they will also need to think about ways that they could comfort situations like that. Now, with the mystery aspect, you could introduce a creature that is sentient enough to obey commands while looking just like a pile of mud with some plant life growing on it. And suddenly, one of the most important officials of the Great Confederation could disappear without a trace in the swamps. And your players will have to find out what happened and who did it. Was it the natives? Or maybe the agents of the country that tries to cut itself from the herb addiction? Or maybe even the competition within the Trade Confederation that still has insane internal conflicts. And if those would ever escalate, the map of the swamps would look like an average Hearts of Iron for peace deal decided by the AI. Which means border gore worse than the HRE. And if something is more dysfunctional than the HRE, it's probably the peak of how dysfunctional things can get. Or maybe it was something completely different. And that's how to create a world with those elements. What is especially nice about this method is that it allows you to create really cool worlds quickly by just randomizing them. You could literally build an entire world by only actually building what would be relevant for the campaign, while creating an illusion that you have built an entire world. I recommend you use this method especially when you're about to start the campaign and are flashing out the key elements and starting to play in the world together with your players. Now, I understand that to some of you this might seem lazy and unoriginal, however, if you will focus on the key elements that you have chosen or maybe rolled and make your world around them, you will probably create a very unique and distinguishable setting. And that's how to world build like Brandon Sanderson. It is it in today's video, thank you so much for watching it until the end. I really hope that you've enjoyed it and found it helpful for creating your worlds. Don't forget to leave a like, comment, and hit that subscribe button if you did. And for now, goodbye.